Welcome to FYI, the four-year innovation podcast. This show offers an intellectual discussion on technologically enabled disruption, because investing in innovation starts with understanding it. To learn more, visit arc-invest.com. Arc Invest is a registered investment advisor focused on investing in disruptive innovation. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. It does not constitute either explicitly or implicitly any provision of services or products by ARC. All statements made regarding companies or securities are strictly beliefs and points of view held by ARC or podcast guests and are not endorsements or recommendations by ARC to buy, sell, or hold any security. Clients of ARC Investment Management may maintain positions in the securities discussed in this podcast. Hello, everyone. My name is Yasin Almantra. I lead crypto at ARC, and I'm super excited to introduce a conversation between ARC CEO Kathy Wood, economist and longtime mentor of Kathy's Dr. Art Laffer, and CEO of 21 Shares Ophelia Snyder. In this conversation, our three guests walk us through the history of money in order to better understand the promise of Bitcoin. Now, Bitcoin is often defined as a technological revolution, but viewing it first and foremost as a monetary revolution can help highlight its true promise. Contrary to the current nationalized market for money and the government's monopoly on issuance, the cryptocurrency market birthed by Bitcoin much better resembles a competitive private market where no coercive monopolies distort price signals by preventing competitors from entering. As you'll see from this conversation, the implications of a divergence this great could be quite profound. So we hope you enjoy. If you like crypto conversations like these, be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel and our FYI podcast. Uh, and with that, uh, I'll let Kathy take it away. Greetings, everyone. Uh, I'm very excited to be here with Art Laffer, my mentor and dear friend of 45 years or more. Who's counting? Uh, who's counting? Uh, who has advised uh, more presidents in his lifetime than I think most uh, economists have on both sides of the aisle, I might add. And uh, Ophelia who is uh, one of the founders of 21 Shares. We are partnered, ARC is partnered very proudly with 21 Shares um, uh, in filing for a Bitcoin ETF. That's public. Uh, I can say that, but that's all I can say uh, according to the rules. So, um, But we're here uh, both to uh, learn and have a, have a dialogue about um, uh, history, the history of money, uh, and uh, how, and this was Art's idea, actually. He said, you know, I think uh, this uh, crypto thing, and he hates the word crypto, uh, I think we'll, we have to convert to digital assets, but uh, it, it feels very much like the free markets uh, that were in place before the Fed was created in 1913. And I thought, wow, that's a, a great topic. Uh, I'd like to learn more about it. And uh, I know that Ophelia is a student of history. Economic history is not taught in schools, uh, but Ophelia has taken it upon herself uh, to learn about uh, that history of money and the history of economics. Uh, and so I think we're going to have a wonderful dialogue here and uh, we'll all learn something, I think, from one another. And uh, and we're delighted to share it with you. Uh, so with that, um, maybe, Art, you can talk about uh, that that conversation we had and um, and what was it uh, that that drew your conclusion that, wait a minute, this is back to the future? Yeah. Well, let me just say, I think it's a trilogue, by the way, too. Trilogue, because you're going to be involved in this as well, deeply. Yeah, there are two parts of U.S. history. One is post-1913, where the government controls money and controls all that stuff, and open market operations, Powell and McChesney Martin and all that stuff, where everyone sort of takes it for granted that the government has a natural right and a monopoly on the creation of money. Then there's the pre-1913 period where monies were private. Uh, the government did define 
uh, what a dollar was. It was one twentieth of an ounce of gold, approximately one ounce of silver. Uh, but that defined it. But the, the government had mints as well. But so did private people. Banks issued their own currency, which was a private banking system. And I sort of view crypto as being moving us back to a private banking system uh, where we have a lot of information about what happened, how well it worked. It was the period where the U.S. became the preeminent country in the world economically. We had stable prices for centuries. All of that stuff, all when money was private. And uh, I'll open it to Ophelia. If you, Ophelia, pop in and let's us just go at it and have some fun. Yeah, uh, look, I, I agree. Um, centralized money is actually a relatively novel concept. Um, and not just in the context of the United States. I mean, if you look at the money, money has historically been decentralized. And so, so is banking, right? The vast majority of the history of money and the history of bank infrastructure was both private and decentralized. Yeah. Um, we sort of participated in a grand experiment towards centralized monetary policy, um, both in the U.S. and in Europe over the last hundred years. That's not status quo. Um, and I think there's a sometimes a lack of appreciation for how new some of the current status quo is, even in some simple things like the level of dollar dominance that you see as a reserve currency is anomalous, right? And it has largely occurred since the 1950s. Um, that that's not a historically stable reality. Um, and I think the lack of appreciation for that sometimes leads us down a path of assuming that the world we inhabit has always been this way, or that this is the only way to do it, or even the best way to do it. It just happens to be how we're doing it right now. And you can look at pre-Fed and 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 post-Fed, post-1913. Uh, I'd, I'd love to think about lessons learned and, and perhaps think about them in the context of what is happening uh, in the digital assets revolution. Yeah, I think that's exactly what I was going to comment on is the failure, I think, of monetary policy to provide a stable numeraire, to provide us the world's best class nation, the, you know, the bank crises, all of those things that have happened when government's been in control has led to a yearning, uh, a market force trying to take us back to the days when when money was private. And I think uh, my view of the way I look at cryptocurrencies is they are a market reaction to poor policies and trying to take us to a new currency that is not controlled by the by the government and solving a lot of those problems. I mean, goodness knows the inflations and high interest rates and all that is not a good thing for the economy. May I ask uh, one thing? Uh, pre 2000, I mean, 1913. Um, the markets or the economy was subject to booms and busts, right? It was it was a very but. So, can we take lessons learned from that time and apply them uh, to this new world as crypto? Yeah, l let me just say, if I can, on that, the booms and busts were financial booms and busts. They were not economic booms and busts. We never got ahead of Great Depression ever before the 1930s. We never had any of these types of major swings in the real sector. We had a lot of financial ones where you get this. Yes. And then all of a sudden, bam, and, yeah, last six, eight months, 10 months, ownerships are changed and we're off to a new run. Uh, that is what was the history, uh, very different from the history post uh, 1913, where we got actual depressions that lasted 15, 20 years, all of that stuff. That, that was not what happened prior to it. And I think to a large extent because of the Fed, and because of government coming top down on the economy. And I, I don't know if you feel that way, Avelia, but. So my question would be, that, that makes some sense, but the real economy in, in the United States and globally has changed materially uh, in that time period. We live in a much more information-based economy than we did previously, right? There, there was just no way to have the types of roles and the types of sophistication in the real sector um, that we do today. And so to some extent, some of the, let's call it overextension and subsequent contractions um, in the real economy, can some of that be attributed to an increase in that complexity, not not purely to the monetary policy and sort of the, the establishment of the Fed, but also to an actual change in the structure of the underlying economy? 
I don't really think so. I mean, you know, obviously there are lots of things that changed, but as far as material things that change this type of structure about how money plays a role, I don't think it does. I mean, the U.S., I mean, from 1640 till 1870 ran trade deficits. We were funded almost entirely by foreign capital that built the U.S. up. We ran trade deficits each and every year, which are capital surpluses. We built our country based on foreign capital coming in, importing net foreign capital. Now, there were a few exceptions, 1776. Uh, let me tell you, Britain did not invest in us that year. Uh, also, 1812, 1813, it didn't. We then had the uh, big uh, uh, canal busts in 1841, 1842, which again were there. But except for about five or six years from that 1640 until 1870, that's that's 230 years. I think we ran trade deficits literally each and every year and required huge amounts of funding, required a common currency, it required long term contracts. All of the futures markets and currency developed around tobacco in Liverpool and tobacco in North Carolina, one being in dollars and one being in pounds. And that was the foreign exchange currency. If you go to Margaret Myers, the New York money market, it's fascinating how these currencies and these future markets developed all based on a world that was supposedly autarkic, but it wasn't autarkic. I mean, we really lived on trade in our relationships in those periods. I, th I think now, obviously it would a lot of, technical differences, but I don't think in real terms that those differences make much uh, of an impact on the need for a good sound currency. And that good sound currency is really the critical element when I when I think of crypto. I agree. I think crypto can sometimes be a, a misnomer and you sort of lose the forest for the trees um, here. But ultimately, the intent behind digital assets holistically is to create a alternative to the centralized financial market. Yes. And that looks like currencies like Bitcoin. There are, there's also infrastructural components around how you're actually able to execute certain types of transactions. And I think that's maybe going towards some of what we're talking about around the increased sophistication in um, in financial markets and in the broader economy as we move towards, let's say, a more digital, digitally native um, ecosystem. I think ultimately, there are a lot of similarities there. I actually agree with you. I think a big part of what crypto and Bitcoin especially is aiming to bring to the table brings us back a little bit to a version of monetary policy that is both inherently more globalized as well as um, less centrally controlled by governments. Much less. Um, I mean, much less. Yeah. If you even look at the names of currencies, you know, it, it's the word German Geld. It comes obviously comes from gold. Uh, the word fee in English is obviously the word cattle in, in Anglo-Saxon. Uh, if you look at so salary, it comes from the salt. Remember, the Romans would always have the salt over the left shoulder in their little bags. And all of these things all have commodity private uh, bases coming back from the beginning. And I look at Bitcoin and these others, and you guys are far more expert than I by miles, miles, miles. But I look at these as being a return to what really worked. And in those centuries, they re good money lasted. Prices were stable for long periods of time, and the U.S. became the preeminent. Now, we did have financial crises, but they were over in six or eight months. They were just, and then boom, and gone. Now we have a crisis, and it lasts for 15, 20 years. What the? Those are terrible crises. So, Art, um, you're talking about a time when uh, when there was the gold standard, effectively. Um, what would a Bitcoin standard look like, or what would a crypto standard now look that's like? That's what I was going to ask you, Kathy, because Bitcoin, <laughs> as I look at it, is a quantity. Yes. And when I look at gold, now obviously gold is a quantity too. It's a a pound is twelve ounces, and you know troy ounces, and, and you know you look at that. But what really was Im important about gold was the exchange ratio between the pound or the dollar and gold was kept stable. And that's what really, because we transact in dollars or we transact in Bitcoin, we transact in whatever, make cattle or whatever. But what you really want to do is have a numeraire that stays stable in value so we can do long-term contracts, the one with the other, and not have to worry about changing values and not having to worry about protecting ourselves in those contracts. And as Ophelia mentioned in our quick conversation, Yesterday, what happened in the Third Bank Holiday Act of 1933 and the changing of the price of gold and all that, that was enormously disruptive to the world. I mean, we were the only country that outlawed, I mean, think of it, outlawing the private holdings of gold. 
How crazy is that? You know, except for dentists, by the way. Dentist and, tablets you know, are fixed price at which you were willing to they were willing to purchase it. They, right. They went from twenty dollars and sixty seven cents an ounce to thirty five. You know, and that's a sixty percent devaluation. We also devalued the currencies. If you know, we we in the Bank Holiday Act, we devalued the current. Well, six months afterwards, we devalued the dollar versus foreign currencies by sixty percent as well. And you know, we we prohibited banks from buying or selling specie. Uh, we 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 prohibited banks from foreign exchange dealings. This is all in the Bank Holiday Act. We we eliminated all gold clauses in contracts, public and private, so you had no guarantee of a value stable value, which is. All the stuff we want money to do, they just violated every damn thing there was in 1933. So, so uh, Art, I, this takes me back to a conversation we had uh, when uh, ARC was doing its first uh, white paper on Bitcoin. At the time, it was Chris Berniski, um, who uh, and and Yasin El Mandra now is our lead. Chris went off to to lead and found and lead a venture fund. But I remember you got through the white paper and uh, you were editing it and uh, you were saying, by the end, once you really had digested uh, what it is, you said, oh my gosh, I've been looking for this ever since we went off the gold exchange standard. Uh, I said, oh, Art, then you, you do think this is a big idea. And he said, yes, I do. He said, now, uh, rules-based monetary system, that's what you're talking about. Now, I don't think you have the right rule. You have a quantity rule here, uh, and I think you need a price rule. And so uh, I think uh, what I'd like to explore here is clearly Bitcoin is is playing uh one of the three major roles of money, store of value with a quantity rule, right? Um, but, uh, you know, it's, uh, we're in a period of great experimentation, which uh, Hayek said we needed to find the, the best uh, monetary system. And uh, I'm wondering... Um, and, and maybe, Ophelia, you can jump in. I know th what art means, and I agree with the, this idea of a price rule and, you know, contracts based on a price rule. Um, uh, do we think that maybe in this grand uh, new experiment that there might be a fork of Bitcoin to enable a price rule? I've been toying with this idea and trying to figure out the answer. Uh, I'd love to I'd love to know your thoughts, Ophelia. So I think, look, you can, cryptocurrencies are inherently de designable and, and composable, and, and there's a number of different ways in which you can do them. If, if you know, if something like a, a stable coin, um, you know, starts to look more like what you're describing, right? Which is a essentially a price fixed, not quantity fixed. Um, I think one of the things that people discount though in these conversations is it's not just about the currency itself right so much of what actually makes monetary supply work is actually around things like multipliers and banks and leverage and infrastructure and actually how m2 money supply actually ends up trickling through the system and i think that's actually where you're going to end up needing more support for crypto in order to make this work is that right now crypto capital markets so the, the issue with currency and sort of monetary supply, it, it's not just about the currency itself, right? It's actually about the currency in the context of an economy and the context of how that monetary supply is expanded and contracted alongside the economy. Relative to demand for it. Relative to demand for it, right? And even when we had private monetary supply, you still had a lot of those features, right? Leverage being one of them. Um, and probably one of the more important ones, right? The, the concept is not just M1, but also on money supply. And I think when we think about crypto and I think about, you know, the next stages, I'm actually less interested in sort of this idea of, you know, a quantity rule versus price rule. I'm much more interested in how do you then deal with actually routing this, um, 
new asset through a complex system like that because you're still going to need it, right? You're still going to need, you're still fundamentally going to need leverage. You, you, the idea of only trading with what you have on hand or only transacting with what you have on hand will actually ultimately cause other issues. It's one of the issues with the gold standard, right? And this sort of coming off of the, um, coming off of the, the gold standard uh, in the 30s, one of the issues that came up and one of the reasons that this was done was to actually allow for um, more leverage, essentially, in monetary policy. All right. Why don't you you take that? Because yeah. uh, it's related. It's a related topic. But um, I have a feeling you're going to be coming back to the price rule. <laughs> yeah, I, I am. I, I, yeah, I don't like the use of M2, by the way. That's 99 percent private and almost very little government. The real thing that the government does control is the balance sheet of the Fed. That's what they control. And open market operations, they can change that. It's called the monetary base. And from anything from the monetary base on, M1, M2, or any of these other aggregates, all are very private. Even bank uh, liabilities uh, are very private because they can change the ratios. They have reserve requirements, but they're not really requirements. They're notional uh, reserves that they hold behind time deposits, uh, uh, demand deposits, all these other liabilities of the bank. So. The one thing the Fed does control is the monetary base. That that it does, but that's the only thing they control. So anytime you go and these others are all part of the leverage of the system, and Ophelia is completely correct, uh, is that when you go pre-1913, all of these banks that did create their own currencies, I, Brian was showing me a little earlier all the different bills from all the different banks. I mean, they look just like real bills. Uh, they have all the names, pictures, all the stuff. And this was from a Chicago bank, from a Detroit bank, from a Philadelphia bank. I mean, it's just way cool. They had the effect of, of changing. If you went into the bank and paid off, uh, get, sent your dollars back in to get reserves, let's say whatever it is, uh, uh, gold or whatever they would have as reserves, they would then reduce the volume, volume of their liabilities in the system. So you had a quantity shrinking and expanding, keeping the value constant. That's the type of thing we need. Now, Britain did it uh, every week, I think it was. You went to the old lady of Threadneedle Street, the Bank of England, and all the banks would go in the morning and say what their net purchasers or sales were of gold and pounds. And then the Bank of England would uh, adjust the liabilities of the system to respond to that, to keep it within a very narrow band uh, on, on that. And that's the sort of thing I would like to see coming about out of crypto. Now, I don't know how that can be done. Who controls the quantity of crypto? I mean, I know there's a formula for some Japanese guy. I think it's a pseudonym, but it makes it all the more mysterious and wonderful. But is there an entity there that can change the volume of crypto to keep the value constant? I, I don't know if there is or not. There may be some holders that would do that, like like the private banks in the U.S. The private banks in the U.S. did actually do that to keep dollars stable. I mean, in value, when there was a drop in the demand for money, I mean, the bank liabilities contracted. When there was an increase in the demand for money, the liabilities of banks expanded. So quantity adjustments were there prior to 1913, and the value of each dollar stayed very stable for a century. I mean, it was incredible. So maybe there's something in crypto that can do that as well. So I'd like actually, Ophelia, to go back to your comments on stable coins. So let's talk about those. And, and Art, you probably are not that familiar with a crisis that occurred around stable coins, specifically algorithmic stable coins. So, um, Ophelia, do you want to talk about that and uh, what went wrong? And I'd like to then afterwards uh, basically say that that is not what Art is talking about and how do we get there? So maybe you can... I, I think that's, a, that's exactly what I was going to get at is I think there have been some attempts uh, to try and create what are essentially like self-referencing stable currencies where based on an algorithm, they're able to essentially maintain a stable value. The issue with that is that because they are self-referencing in some way in terms of the way in which collateral is actually issued against this and sort of you're able to maintain pegs for that pricing by using sort of other assets within the ecosystem. Um, the issue with that is that you can end up with a death spiral, right? Where if you lose that peg and the underlying asset 
base begins to erode in value very, very quickly, those two things can actually play off of each other and result in a death spiral for the currency. Um, and that's exactly what happened uh, to a, a now a very famous crypto project um, called Luna or Terra, uh, or blockchain, um, that essentially allowed these assets to unpeg and sort of enter that spiral. Um, that is obviously not what you're talking about. Um, there, there's a difference between having an asset that is essentially only referencing either itself or another component within its own ecosystem versus an asset that's referencing what you're describing, which is a much larger integration with the broader economy. Right. It's a price rule based on a basket of of something. So I am wondering if, if so in this experimental world that we're in, and I think Hayek would be thrilled to, to be studying this right now, um, I am wondering if for that, uh, in order to serve as the means of exchange, as opposed to just the store of value, um, how, how, would, how would we accomplish that? Would it be a for, it's, it's hard for me to... It's hard for me to envision this, a fork. So so um, basically, you know, these are software programs. And if you want to go in a different direction, you can. Now, Bitcoin is Bitcoin and it's got a it's a powerful ecosystem. And uh, we don't think anything's going to derail that. But if someone wanted to develop a, a, an ecosystem, you know, related to Bitcoin uh, with a price rule, how, how, how could, and maybe Ophelia, you can help me, honestly, as you can tell, we didn't rehearse this at all because it is a real, you know, a, a, a challenge to envision, you know, how, how Bitcoin, and maybe it isn't Bitcoin, but uh, do you want to take that, uh, Ophelia, and run with it a bit, and then we can hand it back yeah. to him. So I think, I mean, ultimately Bitcoin and part of the draw of Bitcoin is that a lot of these elements that you're talking about modifying in order to, to you know, get off of a, a quantity based um, system are very much codified in an unchangeable way. It, it's, if you start making changes to that, it, it's not Bitcoin anymore. It's something else. And yes, theoretically build crypto assets that have any number of features, right? Um, you know, the, the first real, let's call it feature enhancement in terms of blockchain was the move from Bitcoin to Ethereum, right? So Bitcoin contains only address A, send to address B, quantity Z, essentially. that That's the only information that it has in it, right? It's uh, quantities and locations. Um, Ethereum expanded that to allow it to be a much more customizable database of information so that you could actually have a much wider range of types of transactions and types of interactions um, within that infrastructure. That was a major, shift, right? It created a whole new asset. It created a whole new ecosystem. Um, and, and you could obviously have something like that. There's no there's no rule that says you couldn't have a blockchain that operated in that way. I think the challenging piece here is, and, and sort of this is always the challenging piece with crypto, and it's what I was alluding to earlier, is that that connection to the real world economy, which is what would provide the stability, is actually very difficult. Like data flows into and out of blockchains are complicated and sort of inherently introduce some point of centralization. So the question then becomes, if you're going to operate in that way and you're going to rely on some, either you have to rely on a centralized counterparty to provide those signals of whether or not to you know, increase or decrease supply. Um, that's one version, but you are going back to a much more centrally controlled structure. The other option would be to have that happen automatically, but then you're dealing with data quality and data richness and how do you ensure that that's not compromised in some way. And, and actually, those data issues are one of the central issues in DeFi. How do you maintain decentralization and autonomy while being able to validate uh, the quality of data? That, that's where projects like Chainlink uh, are having so much success. Let me see if I can respond a little bit. I mean, Bitcoin has many of the characteristics of gold. Uh, we know what the cost of mining it is and just bits in there. So, you know, gold is very hard to mine. The quantity is relatively fixed back in the uh, 18th, 17th, 19th century. So we had a quantity fixed there. And yet we were still able to have a price rule to have price stability that whole period. So the conceptual framework here is it doesn't seem to me to be any different than the gold standard back in the olden days, because 
uh, Bitcoin is is there. Uh, the the other thing is that um, the fixed quantities. How did we do it back then? I mean, obviously the Bank of England held some sort of store of coins and then just stable uh, of gold and stabilized the value of the pound of the dollar. We can do that back then. Uh, some of the other stuff that you're talking about. The key here is being able to do futures contracts in numeraire, in a numeraire. That is the key. And how can we do that to where the borrower and the lender both understand what the value of the Bitcoin is going to be today, tomorrow, five years from now, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 30 years from now that we had with gold? How does that authority come into place? Uh, and it does not have to be government. It really doesn't. Uh, but how does that authority come into place so that Bitcoin can not only supplant the dollar, which I would love to see, but it has to supplant the dollar with a much more valuable numeraire. I mean, valuable, not in the sense of how much it costs, but valuable in the sense that it serves the purpose of money very well. Store value, medium of exchange and stability of the numeraire. That's the key. The stability piece is interesting because it's often one of the things people raise as a criticism of why crypto will never work as money, right? Is that the, the price is inherently too unstable and there's too much volatility. Um, they're not wrong. It is volatile. Um, now, I think that changes as you start to see broader usage and it changes as you start to see a larger number of market participants. You need to get to a place where like crypto Twitter does not have an impact on the price of Bitcoin, right? Where the, the sentiment of a small group of people can't actually change the direction of that market. Um, what? How many people does it take to change general sentiment on a but let me, USD? Can I push you on this idea that you're just expressing yeah. right now? We had a transition a lot, lot longer ago than gold standard. I mean, from cattle and salt and 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 other things, seashells, whatever they were, to gold. Gold was intrinsically, everyone I'm sure back then made that arguments that gold is inherently unstable. And it's the same exact arguments that now are going from gold to Bitcoin that was solved by the marketplace, not by governments. Now, the reason it was un, not unstable is because you knew what it took to raise cattle. You knew what the cost was to have a calf, to raise it up to full size, all of that stuff, there was a cost function there that the marginal cost of a, of a new cattle was exactly the same over long periods of time. It still takes 24 months to get a two year old heifer, you know, and the same thing with salt mining and the same thing with seashells. You had to go down there and collect them. And blah, blah, blah. But gold was different than that. Now, gold had a secondary market of, of, of adornment or whatever you want to say, jewelry, et cetera, or whatever. What we need to do is find a crypt coin, a crypto, a Bitcoin solution to dumping it when the value is too high and storing it when the value is too low. Somehow to have a mean regressive process. And that should be done by the private market, not just by large numbers of sellers or buyers. That that won't do it. So, but, so well, yeah, actually, that's, that's already happening. Well, you're you're right. Yeah, it is. And you can see it in the data. And this is what you're getting at, right? That the new data around long term holding in yep. um, of crypto assets. We have all of that data. That's, we have that data I mean, that's what I'm looking for to have the not, but to have the where the quantities vary, but not the prices. So, so what's in, yeah, this is really a very interesting topic. Uh, so, would you suggest then? I mean, it's the core developers who uh, are, I mean, they will never, I, I mean, from what I can see, what you can see probably, what we all think is that the core developers would not, would never modify anything uh, in terms of the mathematical metering to get to 21 million units. The problem with that is what if the demand for it, it is much more than 21 million units as uh, as the economy evolves. There's no adjustment mechanism to meet increased demand, right? This is it, the, exactly. There are actually two, right? So one is that when you want to actually soft up excess demand, what you're seeing is you're actually seeing private behavior 
accomplish yes. that, which is yes. you're seeing people accumulate assets into wallets and those wallets are not moving. They're actually very, very, very stable in the lower end of the price range. There's yes. no interest in liquidating them. And you're actually seeing that in terms of the number of wallets that are holding um, who haven't been used in over a year. You're actually seeing that. Yeah, but there's All there's time a different thing here, Kathy and, and Ophelia, if I may. You don't need to have the Bitcoins change. What you need to do is have some person, Sarah, doing a forward contract in Bitcoins, a private sector person. So I can say, you know, if Bitcoin rises to a higher level, I'll, I'll, sell, I'll, I'll sell Bitcoins. Uh, and, and I'll take on liabilities there. And I, as a private person, will arbitrate. That's what banks did with gold. Banks changed gold by issuing their liabilities. Here's a question on that. And I, I that that would be a wonderful solution. What's, you know, what we're beginning to see is as long term holders increase, in other words, they're called hodlers, hold on for dear life, right? Um, as as those increase, another phenomenon is evolving here where institutions are developing an interest in this new asset class. And, you know, they could that the, their their incremental demand as the long term holder base increases could, uh, you know, to could force the price up parabolically, which would destabilize the. Ecosystem. But tell me how. You... No, but this is something different, Kathy. Okay. And... This is private people, a different company coming in who knows Bitcoin, who holds Bitcoin, transacts in Bitcoin, and it's like a bank that holds gold and holds silver and does all that. But, but yeah, but issues it'd be like BlackRock in Bitcoin. Kind of. For maybe another example that I actually think is maybe more accessible is. Actually, I don't know that that has to be a bank. Well, I don't mean if it's you... a bank, but an like institution Burr. that. So the quality so, of bitcoins in the market increases dramatically, but the net amount is still twenty billion or whatever. And I, look, when I first got into crypto, uh, one of the first people to talk to me about crypto was my mom. And my mom came to me and she was talking about um, something really interesting. She's like, you know, if you look at companies like Merck, their hedge costs are very, very, very high because they're dealing with a, basically an inability to match their liabilities and their income in terms of currency. And it, it makes sense, right? They're transacting on a global basis and they're like the perfect microcosm for a globalized economy in a single company, right? And they're actually spending a ton of time and money actually adjusting those like liabilities and assets to match each other. And you can have entities like that. Once you start transacting and, and once Bitcoin is actually used in that way for commerce as a reserve currency, as a currency for these types of transactions, you'll start to see entities actually need to provide that type of infrastructure for themselves. And it's really interesting because it's, to me, always has seemed more accessible to understand in the context of someone who's actually doing trade versus necessarily a bank who's doing it for as a financial transaction. Yeah. But something like Merck is actually a very good yeah, but example. Let me, I'm, I'm talking about something. I'm talking about substitute uh, Bitcoins, a company that Whatever the quantity of bitcoins is, I'm a company and I will issue my own liabilities and call them bitcoins. And I will guarantee them in terms of bitcoins there. Anytime you want to bring these liabilities back into me, I'll give you a bitcoin back and thereby uh, and have a fractional reserve system and have that go. Now, you probably would need government inspectors like you do with did with gold coins because, you know, they'd follow the reserves these state banks had and all that to make sure that their liabilities in dollars and gold was exactly, you know, they had enough reserves to make sure they didn't go bankrupt and do that death spiral you talked about. But this is an infrastructure uh, that would be set up by private companies to create private Bitcoins, different from the actual Bitcoins. They're Bitcoin light. Huh. That's the way That's the way the dollar system did to adjust quantities and keep values constant. How is that materially different than, you know, M2 money supply? Today, that's run through banks and it's it's far more regulated and sort of the, the way we interpret leverage is a little bit different. But structurally, that seems like it would be largely the same well, thing. It is similar to a bank liability. Yeah, it's exactly bank liabilities. And you check the bank liabilities against their reserves. Now, what is what is the reserve today? It's nothing. It's the trust and faith of the U.S. government. Hello. I'm not into that. That's why I like Bitcoin, because I don't trust and have any faith in them, to be honest with you. And the results of the last couple of years are a perfect example. 
uh, perfect. But what you need to do is have these people run businesses as businesses. You're going to get collapses. You're going to get boom. You're going to get those financial crises of the 18th and 19th century. You will get those, but they'll be over in, in six weeks or eight weeks. Blah, 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 blah. And the bank that was issuing those liabilities will go away. But you will have the quantity modulation as opposed yes. to the price change. And that's exactly what I, we had stable prices there. I mean, the dollar value, the the gold value of goods and services didn't change for centuries. It didn't change. Now, we know the quantity of gold was fixed or relatively quantifiable. And how did that happen? And that's because fine up private institutions did all the modification. If you set the price high enough, you can always solve that. And, you know, we did have crises. We did have collapses. There were times when we had a war in Europe and the price of gold went way up. And that's when the Bank of England would have a, a judicious suspension of convertibility. They'd go, oh, we won't buy or sell. Let the price go. Boom, boom, boom. And then once things settled down again, then they came right back in again and stabilized. What we did during the Civil War, uh, 1862 to 1878, we had the greenbacks. They went way up in inflation, doubled, halved in value relative to gold. And then we brought them back down to at the end of 19, 1878, we reestablished it at the old convertible. That type of system, there's no reason why banks, why other financial institutions can't do that with Bitcoin. So do you think traditional financial institutions would play that role? Or are we talking about a completely different set of characters? I think it's a smirk, to be honest with you. I mean, yeah. I why yeah. companies wouldn't specialize in this. They don't have to be banks. They don't have to be yes. banks in the traditional but, sense of the word. So let's think about this. How, uh, so, right. And the SEC with its protect the customer uh, or, or the bank regulators protect the customer. How, how would they how would they react to this? What could they do, if anything? Well, what they did in 1913 and earlier is they had bank inspectors to go to check on the reserves. And that's where they had that. Remember, it's a you know, with, with the, 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 you know, the penny, the, the Mark Penny. These guys would go and check each yeah. bank and the banks right after they were inspected and OK, they'd send all their reserves to the next bank where the guys would find the same penny over and over again. Uh, that's what happened. I don't trust the SEC today to do that. Right. But I do trust so, the new That's what's so great. That's what's but so great both. about this ecosystem. It's the transparency of love these it, blockchains. Love it, love it. But I also realize the role of the SEC and quite frankly, the the role of bank regulators, we're, we're entering a phase where it's being interpreted very differently. And we'll see where that all ends up. But historically, I mean, ultimately, the SEC's job, investor protection is not. These two things don't run contra to each other. At the end of the day, if you're going to issue something, the information about what it is you're issuing should be accurate. And if it's not accurate and you're lying and stealing someone's money, someone should punish you for that. that. That's but what that's the job. What should do is transparency and transparency alone. So you know what that these accounts, these people are stating are true. It's like medical transparency. It's like financial transparency. You know, we need to know that the truth is being exposed and therefore we can make good decisions based upon the authenticity of the information we receive. And and the more decentralized and transparent the ecosystem is, the better, the more secure, right? Yes. The less you have a need for, um, if you can check the source information yourself, you need less disclosures to be provided to you, right? If I don't need to tell you I have five things if you can go check that I actually have them. Yes. Right. right. And it's, you know, for example, in, in gold ETFs, it's the reason why like very large investors in gold ETFs, when they started moving towards um, actual like bullion and gold bars would ask to see the vaults. Yeah, right. Exactly. It's the exact same concept. But here's the thing. You can do that with an address. You can do that in a decentralized way. Anybody can look up that information. You don't need me to tell you that I have five things. You can check that I have five things. And yet that changes the role of accuracy transparency and disclosure, which is actually so much of what, quite frankly, the SEC does. But now, the, but, but but now the disclosure, There's more stuff about leverage. Uh, but, the disclosure you're talking about is the disclosure of the financial intermediary, not the transactor. The transactor exactly. remains anonymous and anonymity. A dollar bill is a dollar bill. When you get it, you don't know who owned it before, who had it, where it was, what the balance sheet. A dollar bill is a dollar bill. 
But you need to have the financial intermediaries be transparent so that I know what their assets are and what their leverage is so that I can value their pseudo bitcoins in the marketplace, just like the pseudo dollars produced by the Illinois Bank in 1893. And I I think that's the interesting thing with crypto is that it's actually one of the pieces I think people get wrong so often when they talk about this is actually Bitcoin is less anonymous than U.S. dollars. And it would be one of the major issues with a setup like this, right? I, I do, in fact, know who owned my Bitcoin before me. Now, I know them as Sudanana. You know them by an oh. internet address. Yes, yes. Exactly. I know them as address? a string. I, I'm old and I don't understand what you just said. So because of the way blockchains work, you can actually trace the origin of a Bitcoin from the day it was mined through every wallet that's ever owned it. Now, the thing about that is those wallets are pseudonyms, right? They're not actually linked to your identity. So there's no way for me without an enormous amount of effort and probably a government spina to go and figure out address 0x, insert a bunch of characters here, belongs to this person. That link is actually difficult unless you've either A, connected it to a uh, fiat on or off ramp or some sort of regulated endpoint or connected it to your identity through some other means. And there are reasons why you might want to do that. And people do that. Some people don't. Um, And there's a bunch of new technology to allow for a tighter link there. But what it does mean is that I can actually look and say, okay, well, where did this Bitcoin come from before? And you can actually trace its origin. Um, And there are significant pros and cons to that. One of them being it is actually less anonymous than a dollar bill. It is about as anonymous as a bank transfer, but that is less anonymous than a dollar bill. Yeah, and it would be allow you to have the reserves of a of a of a non entity, a liability issuer in Bitcoin to be assured that they do in fact have those reserves of Bitcoin, and even though their liabilities are larger, they have enough reserves in Bitcoins to be able to any reasonable withdrawals on their accounts, they would be able to match those withdrawals. That's exactly what a bank does. And that's the role of a bank regulator is that last piece, right? Well, I, I just like the, the bank regulator concept of the SEC. That, you, that just scared me when, when you said that. That, that did scare me. Uh, anonymity is important. A uh, $100 bill is now all the people, my, my colleagues at Harvard and Yale and all that want to get rid of these because they believe it's a source of criminality. But it's also a, a, a source of anonymity, not criminality. And and I think that anonymity is very important in transactions. Would this be a showstopper for you? It's uh, art if you if you knew uh, every one of your Bitcoin could be traced, but uh, people don't know it's you. It's a pseudonym. Well, then then they don't know it's me. But if but what Ophelia said was they can ultimately get it back to you, and that that, that does that does reduce the value of a Bitcoin. Well, the FBI is, I mean, expert in cryptography, and uh, we know they've been able to trace some criminal activity. Uh, so that's because the criminals is- were sloppy. There is no way you can do private cryptology today and not have a snowball's chance in hell of anyone finding out what your codes are. I mean, you can do that today if you just know that stuff. All you need is the prime number basis there, the trillions of places, and you've got it. So there's no way of breaking those codes. So the sloppy ones who did it loosely uh, were the ones I'm sure the FBI was able to get. I'm sure they do not get the U.S. CIA or NSA uh, breaks. Uh, They just don't. So I feel like we've come a long way in terms of, uh, but uh, maybe just two more questions. Um, One of them is I want to get back to this. Okay, we have this institutional interest brewing in Bitcoin. Uh, it's mathematically metered to go up uh, at a measured pace until we hit 20, uh, 100 million units. And, but let's just say right now, because of uh, the institutions expressing interest in this new asset class, you know, the marginal demand goes up and drives the prices, price up dramatically to a million dollars. Bitcoin's at around $30,000 right now to a million dollars. Let's let's just say that, that happened in the world that we've been describing here. Would that do we need to get through that first, as you say, Ophelia, and you know, you know, stabilize the ecosystem as more and more become long-term holders, 
or can we uh, can we get to the world that you're describing, Art? Um, uh, y- you know, with these other private actors. Yeah, let, let me if I can go on this. It's really interesting what you're talking about now, both of you there. We had the same type of thing in, in Europe when the discoveries of the New World came in. All the ships from Spain and Portugal brought back gold from the New World there. And there was a huge flood of gold into the New World. And of course, inflation occurred as well. There, there was a famous dissertation done at the University of Chicago. The, the, the top scholar in this was Earl Hamilton who was a professor at the University of Chicago on this type of stuff. That sort of is the speculative price bubble in gold that occurred there. It was not moderated yes. out. It was Now, after that, it was moderated out, and the stability then became, gold became stable valued over long periods of time. But you're right. Maybe we do have to go through that. I mean, we clearly have gone through it. What was the price of uh, Bitcoin 10 years ago? Well, we got in in 2015 at $250. There you go. Okay, three thirty thousand today. Good, good by you. Know why I'm an investor with you, Kathy. You know why I love you. Ha ba 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 ba. You know I just. <laughs> but, but but you know we've gone through a lot of that. Now what we need to do is go through the thing where you get inventory and arbitragers, uh, and issuers of Bitcoin, and just develop a banking system around the gold stock. The gold stock is Bitcoin. Now what we need are the financial institutions around the gold stock to vary the quantity of crude crypto gold, if you will, to stabilize its value over long periods of time. And I think we're, I mean, if I've noticed, it looks like Bitcoin prices have stabilized a lot lately. Well, what happened was during the regional bank crisis, and you and I did a podcast during it, uh, the regional bank crisis, Bitcoin, as regional banks were imploding the stocks, uh, Bitcoin went from 19,000 to 30,000, and it's 30,000 today. Now, part of the reason it's gone back to 30,000 after a little bit of a jog here is a speculation about a Bitcoin ETF, and we can't say anything about that. No, the Bitcoin ETF is what I'm talking about in the financial intermediary. That's what a Bitcoin ETF is. You are a financial intermediary. That's what just where you should be, and that's why I'm a huge fan of Art and Kathy. I mean, you know, because you will develop. You, didn't you develop the first uh, ETF that was man- actively managed? Well, I, they, technically there were others, but truly active, uh, completely transparent. I think we qual- certainly qualified as one of the first and now the, I'm the largest. I'm telling everyone you were the first, Kathy, and I'm going to stick to my guns, by goodness. I remember talking with you about all that and all the uh, difficulty you had to get permission to do an ETF and all of that. I remember all of that. Now, you can do ETFs on countries and stuff like that, but an ETF like yours was, was it actively managed and you did the displays of all the transactions you did? I mean, you were the pathbreaker there. And you're the pathbreaker, I gather, once again, but you can't say anything about it. I can't say anything but about it. But I think you're going to be the pathbreaker there. Too. <laughs> um, this is exciting. This is wonderful information. And you're making me feel a lot better about Bitcoin and about crypto. Yay! Yay! And I know we're going to do another uh, podcast so that you can learn more about uh, the cryptography and all of the details. So we'll save that for later. I don't know the computer, don't know the computer programs. You know, I'm a phone oh, type yeah. of guy. I don't do emails. I don't have a computer. But I do understand the math of cryptology and all that. And we are at a point in time where crypto can never be broken by anyone if you don't want it to be. Now, that was not true historically. You could do all sorts of bubble sorts, blah, 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 all this stuff historically. But now we've gotten to the thing where the chances of doing that are infinitely small. One last question then, and it does have to do with government. So, um, you know, uh, Yassine and, and uh, during our morning meeting, Yassine mentioned that um, Hayek also said that you know, the only way this could happen was somewhat surreptitiously so that the government, you know, if the government understood what we are talking about now about the potential for Bitcoin um, in 2009 or 10 or 12, um, they they might have just tried to squash it. Uh, but uh, it has been a little bit of a surreptitious more. It's been couched in terms of technology, as a matter of fact, and and therefore, is it in the purview of any particular government uh, agency? 
do you think we are past the point where the government can come in and squash this movement? It should not be U.S. based. It should not be. Right. It should be multiple country based. Uh, yes, that, and it is. That's number one. I don't think any government should have control over crypto. I, I think unanim- uh, anonymity is a very important characteristic of this. Uh, e- even though your little purses or wallets or whatever you call them there, uh, I do think that people should be allowed to be able to transact without someone knowing exactly what they bought and sold. Uh, and even though i totally against criminal activities, I don't think that's a criminal activity. I think people want uh, privacy uh, even when they don't do crimes. Uh, and so therefore I do think that, and I think what you're, you, you call it uh, surreptitious, did you? I think it's sneaky, uh, but the sneaky thing I think is out of the bag. I think the genie is out of the bottle and I don't think they see how the U.S. by itself could solve this problem. They would have to try to do this. I mean, did you see the latest news on the on the world currency now that they're trying to do on a crypto uh, with the BRICS and then all the countries that are just signed on to that? All of them are non-Western, non-European, non-U.S. And they want to just say to hell with these paper currencies there and all that stuff. And let's get a solid currency. Now, they talk about it in terms of replacing the dollar. But that's not what they're doing. They're trying to replace the dollar because the dollar's crappy. If the dollar were stable in value and have done all the things we described that a currency should do, uh, there'd be no attempt on the part of any of these countries to do what they're trying to do. It's because the dollar has failed that these people are trying to develop a cryptocurrency. And I believe in that very much. And I love to see the private sector solving a problem that the government has ultimately created. Monetary policy is, comes in cycles, right? And if you look, we've seen cycles of the global reserve currencies being being French, being English, being American, being far more diversified than they are today. I think a lot of what we're seeing is what comes next. Um, I think this chapter of monetary policy um, is likely ending. Um, we haven't seen real pushes away from the dollar in the way we're, we've seen in the last year in quite some time, not not just with the, the, the BRICS currencies and, and gold reserves, but also in terms of simple things like uh, Southeast Asian countries deciding they want to settle their trade in local currency um, instead of necessarily settling in dollar. I mean, those are all harbingers of a new era in monetary policy. Now, crypto can play a role in that. Crypto is playing a role in that, both as a technology as well as, as Bitcoin as a currency. And I think one of the things that we sort of taken for granted in this conversation is how early things still are. I mean, my my company's role is to talk to sophisticated investors about crypto basically all day long. And, and we're still in the early innings from both a technology perspective in terms of how this stuff actually works and our ability to use it um, to, to allow for sort of private based derivatives to be built, to allow for integration into the broader like monetary supply. It's still early. We're still working out the kings on the technology side. We're still getting people educated about it. We're still well, welcoming people. You better be fast because it's going to come quickly. I think what you've done is, yes. is you've got the right spot, Ophelia. You're right in the spot. You're going to be shocked at how quickly you're going to have to respond to this. Gold was there until 1972 uh, on the official level. Now, then it was dollar after that, only dollar. But no one had the franc. No one had the mark. No one had the pound unless they solidified it in terms of gold before that. And today, that's not the case. So I, I'm going to wrap this up because I think this is ending at a very good place. Um, and we'll continue learning. Uh, the Fed, and you know, I have my expe- in my experience, when uh, uh, investors f- focus obsessively on, on a number or two, and in the case it is employment and PCE deflator, lagging indicators that the Fed is using uh, in its uh, monetary uh, policy, um, just obsessive, compulsive. I know we're near the end of that being important, and that kind of fits in with what you said, uh, Ophelia. And then, uh, and then Art, you know, what I love about these conversations with you is you are steeped in economic history. You uh, uh, and and you understand monetary ecosystems better than anyone I know. Uh, and so what you're saying is you discover what is happening through crypto and you're saying, that's it, that's it, that's it. It increases my confidence. 
and my understanding of how this might evolve uh, with the other actors. In, yeah. As long as it can go from a quantity rule to a price rule. The price rule is central. Without the price rule, this system will die. It needs but, to go. Okay, and so you, that, you can, that, that is where we need to go on and this next one. that's where I think one. other bank companies like what Ophelia was saying, other instances like Burke and these can become financial intermediaries, issuing their own liabilities, having their own assets, and being able to change the quantity to make sure that prices are stable. Once that yes. happens, bye-bye dollar. Bye-bye yeah. bye ruble. Bye-bye mark. Bye-bye yen. Bye-bye pound. The, the pound has gotten so bad, ladies, that they're now calling it the ounce. <laughs> Oh, Art, we have to leave. Sorry. No, always. Oh, so thank you so much, Art uh, and Ophelia. I think this was wonderful. And I look forward to the next one because I think there's a dearth of uh, economic history in terms of guiding us in, in this new world. Lessons learned in the past. Uh, what have we learned? And how can we do this better in the future? So I'm excited by the next one. Yay. All right. Thank you oh, so much. Way, Kathy, thank you. Record. You're on in Orlando. All right. Sounds great. Sounds great. See you guys. Thank you very much. It's a lovely, lovely session. Take care. Bye-bye now. Bye. ARC believes that the information presented is accurate and was obtained from sources that ARC believes to be reliable. However, ARC does not guarantee the accuracy or completeness of any information, and such information may be subject to change without notice from ARC. Historical results are not indications of future results. Certain of the statements contained in this podcast may be statements of future expectations and other forward-looking statements that are based on ARC's current views and assumptions, and involve known and unknown risks and uncertainties that could cause actual results, performance, or events to differ materially from those expressed or implied in such statements.